Now, computational thinking will probably be the most challenging of the thinking skills for you, because it's something that you probably haven't experienced in your own education, um, and it introduces some concepts that will be quite foreign to you. But the first of which is not so difficult. It's around problem thinking. Now, very often, unfortunately, teachers will set problems for students. We relatively rarely allow students to come up with what the problem is. But actually identifying problems and seeing them as problems is the first step in students gaining the confidence and perspective on the world that there are problems that they can solve. If they're only ever solving problems that you set them, and they never have the opportunity to identify problems themselves, they won't really be empowered to solve their own problems because they haven't gone through that first step of being able to engage with identifying um, the problem to solve. So one of the first aspects of computational thinking is allowing students to see the world as lots of problems to be solved. Now problems though don't necessarily have to be negatives. They can be opportunities. A problem can be seen as a way of being entrepreneurial. An, op an, um, an opportunity to do something in a new, exciting, interesting way that opens up new possibilities for them. So that's the first aspect of um, computational thinking. And a key element of this are two skills called abstraction and decomposition. Now, decomposition, mentioned briefly before, is where we break down problems into their smaller and smaller steps so that we can then solve them. There's a joke in that, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. Okay, it's impossible to eat the elephant as a whole in one gulp, um, but broken down into tiny, tiny pieces, it's then achievable. That's the metaphor for solving problems. Um, if we're trying to solve a, any reasonably complex problem, it's just going to be too big. Let's say problem is to create a really great video game like Sp uh, Space Invaders. Now, that's a reasonably complex problem. It involves music and graphics and motion and bullets flying up and detecting whether or not they hit um, other objects and explode and all the rest. Individually, though, all of those elements become a manageable task to be solved. And by working on them all individually, decomposing the overall problem down into smaller and smaller pieces that are then manageable, we go through the process of decomposition. And that's an important skill for students to learn about any problem they have in order to solve. Coupled with that is we have a concept of abstraction. Now, abstraction is quite a complex concept. Um, but essentially, it's taking something and... Um, abstracting it so that the complexity is hidden away and we can then manage it. So an example um, we use in computing is that the way computers work, there's actually a whole lot of electrical signals going between transistors. Now we abstract that into what's called binary code, which is zeros and ones. And a zero represents the transistor being on and there's electricity, sorry, transistor, yeah, on and the electricity is stopped from flowing and transistor being off, and the electricity can flow, which we represent as a one. So the zeros and ones of binary are actually an abstraction of the electricity flowing through a circuit. Now, zeros and ones, though, are still too complex for us to work with. So what we do is we turn those zeros and ones into commands. Um, so a command might be to print. Now, that print command would be a whole series of zeros and ones. Um, we don't have to remember those zeros and ones. All we need to remember is the word print. And it will do what all those zeros and ones tell the computer to do in relation to printing something on the screen. So now we have a whole lot of textual commands that are abstractions of those zeros and ones. Now, for young children, all of those textual commands, such as print and go to and um, delete and all the rest, are still quite complex. So what we do is we turn them into blocks. And you've seen that in some of the uh, material that we've looked at so far, and we'll be doing it in more detail as we go into more of the, pro the programming languages. And we call this a block-based programming language. 
where students can then move around these blocks instead of having to worry about the, what the words mean. And an even more abstraction is where we use icons, which don't have any words or numbers on them generally, and we just associate those pictures together and by moving them around in different um, organizations, we can then have a program um, execute and do something. So a little bit like the B-Bots. With the B-Bots, you use those arrows. So the arrow that was sort of pointing up was an abstraction of the word forward, which might be a command in the programming language that the B-Bot uses that would then be in binary code, a whole series of zeros and ones that would be sent to the motors and so forth in the circuits in the actual B-Bot. But we didn't need to know about all that. All we need to know is that pressing that little upward arrow would make the robot move up. So it was abstracted. Now abstraction can be used in other areas as well. We have what's called the ladder of abstraction, where we go from the most concrete such as the transistors and the zeros and ones, through to the most abstract, which in programming language uh, would be those icons such as an upward arrow. But we can see it in lots of other areas of the world. Um, I give the example of books. So information, well, say a, a really, really concrete um, example would be my copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. There's only one. Um, I own it. It's my copy. Now, abstracting that, there are quite a lot of copies of To Kill a Mockingbird owned by other people and in libraries and bookshops and so forth. So there are all the copies of To Kill a Mockingbird, which is an abstraction of up from the concrete version that I have of the one individual copy. But there's also lots of books written by um, famous authors. That's the level of abstraction again. Then there's a whole lot of books that we could classify around the concept of novels. Some of them, as a subset, were written by famous authors, but there were also lots of other novels that were written by less famous authors. And then beyond just novels, there's also a whole lot of other books, non-fiction books, etc. And so they form another level of abstraction. And then beyond books, there's also publications, including comics and magazines and a whole lot of other types of publications. And beyond publications, there's just general information, including the internet and a whole lot of other ways of um, passing on knowledge. So this is the idea of abstraction. Now, why we need to understand it is the idea of generalization. Each of these levels of abstraction allow us to generalize. Now, if I was to create a solution for my copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, let's say if it's going to be a book cover, now, my particular copy is of a particular size, and it's if I design it just for that copy, and just so it has my name on it and all the details, it's only going to be really useful for me and for my particular copy. If, however, I generalized my solution and made a cover for a book that would fit any copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, it would still have To Kill a Mockingbird written on it and so forth, but it would fit any of the different copies. That's more generalizable. So say if I was selling this, I've got more people I could sell that to. Now, a more generalizable solution still would be if I made a book cover that could fit on any book. So now my generalized solution, which is not too different to the design solution I had for my specific copy, is now useful and could be sold to anyone that needed a copy of a cover for a, for a book. So that's the power of generalization. And computers are really good at generalization. If I write a computer program that can do something that I want it to do, let's say if I want to count up the number of students in my class, it helps me to um, take the role and it'll give me a total of the number of students in my class. That's all really well and good, but there might be other teachers that could use that. So it could be generalized so that it could be used for anyone needing to take a role for their class. Then there's people outside of teachers that might need to take um, account of how many people they've got. It might be for a sports stadium or a movie theater. So now it's being generalized. My little software solution that just makes account of how many people there are is now being used in quite a different way 
but it's still the same essential solution, the same code. And now it might be used in a whole lot of other ways. Say it's counting the number of objects we have in inventory. And we suddenly someone decides, okay, we could use that to count the number of things we have on the International Space Station. So my original concept of a piece of software that would solve a problem for me around counting the number of items there are is suddenly being able to be generalized and used in tens of thousands and millions of ways. That's the power of generalization, the power that the computing industry has faced and why it has been so successful. Google as a search engine was a really simple piece of programming code that was simply about searching through a database of web pages and keywords associated with those web pages. Someone realized that that could be generalized and used for any web page and a huge number of keywords. Similarly for Facebook. Facebook started out as a college um, website for rating female college um, students. And then you could put some comments on that. And someone then realized, okay, we could rate not just um, make profiles of female college students, we could make anyone's profiles. And we could make any comments that we want to share. And we could share photos, we could share other things. And suddenly it became a really useful tool used in a way completely different to how it was originally envisaged because it was generalizable. And that's a really powerful concept that students need to understand in terms of computational thinking. Okay, so beyond those aspects of computational thinking, we also have algorithmic thinking. This is seeing the world as a series of step-by-step -step processes, that things happen in the world in a sequence of instructions. Um, when we tie our shoelaces, we do one thing first, then we do another thing, do another thing, and we end up with solving a problem of tying our shoelaces. How we get to school in the morning, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we eat our breakfast, we travel to school, we put our bags in our locker, and we turn up to class. That's a sequence. And that's the first concept that students learn about algorithmic thinking. The next concept though from that is around um, selection. When we come to come to school, we might have a choice. We could go by bus, we could ride our bikes, we could take our parents' car, we could walk. So we're making a decision. And that's what we call a branching or selection process. And in our algorithms, we can represent that in flow charts and so forth to show how the world can work through that problem and end up to our solution. The other concept around that is um, iteration or, or repeating or looping. So one aspect of this is we actually do that five times a week. Um, every seven days, five of those are spent going to school. So instead of um, writing that out as five separate um, set of instructions, we could put a loop around that and say, do that five times. Then do the weekend, then do it again. And we could have a loop around that as well. And that's called a nested loop. So we've got our loop around the five um, times we go to school during the week. Then we add on our weekend and we put a loop around that. And we say, do that for 10 weeks for the term. And then we could put a loop around that and say, do that for four terms. And that's the year. And then we say, OK, going to school for 13 years, do that. 13 times. So through those processes, we can start um, representing what occurs in the world around various things we want to program and express through our solutions. And we can do that and graphically through flowcharts or through just explaining it. And a big part of algorithmic thinking is defining and describing our algorithms. Another part is specifying what the algorithm should do. Because very often, students um, lose track of what they're actually trying to achieve. So specifying the solution is really important to be able to see whether or not our algorithm actually ends up achieving what we want to do. And it makes it very hard to test and evaluate it if we haven't specified. Because you don't know whether or not the solution actually um, does what you expected it to do if you haven't, at the start, specified what it is you want it to do.
Okay, so that's the aspect of algorithmic thinking. Another element is data thinking. Seeing the world as an interplay and interrelationship of data. Um, data really makes up 95% of all the computing aspects of technology. Uh, almost all the solutions we have to do with technology have been around the uses and manipulation of data. Now, some of the things students need to be able to do and understand is that they can collect data. They can, let's say, take observations of temperature and measure how temperature is changing over time. They can do a whole range of different ways of going out and collecting data. It might be through interviews or through taking observations. And data doesn't just have to be numbers. It could be photos. It could be um, people doing interviews and telling you about things. There could be a whole range of things that can be data. Then we need to be able to represent that data in various ways. Now, this might be through doing graphs or storing the data in various processes, doing tables, doing infographics, various ways we can actually um, represent the data so that we can make meaning out of it. And that allows us then to interpret the data. So we can extract information from that data. So we can see patterns, we can see relationships between the data and so forth. So we're going to be doing a lot of looking at data as we go through this course, because it's such a fundamental element of digital technologies in particular. But starting with the moment, thinking about it as a thinking skill. Students seeing the world as a collection of data and where they can gather that data, represent that data and make meaning of that data to better understand the world and better solve problems. So there's a range of different types of data. Um, from geographical and cultural and scientific and financial and statistical, and meteorological, natural and transport based data. And we can do various things with that data. We can sort it, we can arrange it, we can present it visually, we can turn it into stories. And it allows us then to make use of that data in meaningful ways. The final thing in relation to computational thinking is evaluative thinking. This is where when we test and evaluate solutions, we need to be able to do so in a way that we can critically try to come up with an explanation of what's happened. So an evaluation includes two parts, um, a conclusion about what's happened and an explanation of why it's happened. So evaluation is really important when we want to come to understanding if our solutions are effective but it also helps us in coming up with um, what those solutions should be. Of course, by def knowing that we're going to have to evaluate it, it helps us guide us towards a more robust solution that can stand up to scrutiny rather than being a fairly superficial solution that may not be actually particularly effective. So seeing the world in an evaluative way that um, we're going to need to, at some point, do an evaluation of it, allows us again to think about problems in a different way than if we didn't have that as a computational thinking skill. So, for your activity, what I'd like you to do is to describe a lesson that helps develop in students the concept of abstraction. So that's just one of the thinking skills. You'll need to, in your lessons, uh, incorporate um, processes to develop lots of these thinking skills and abstraction is only one part of the computational thinking skill but for this activity just stick to abstraction and see if you can come up with an activity that would help develop students ability to abstract so that will mean you need to understand what abstraction means and how that could be applied in terms of your teaching and what students would be able to do if they can abstract. Now, you can, well, I'd like you to try to do that without using ChatGTP. If you really get stuck, I've given you an example and you could utilize ChatGTP to help you out. But see if you can come up with um, an activity that would help students learn abstraction um, and submit that 